share my screen. Can you all see this? Quinn and Irene. Yeah, cool. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to have you all join us this afternoon. My name is Caroline Forrest, and I'm one of the academic advisors in the fall program for freshmen. I want to give everyone a little bit more time to log in, so I'll plan on getting us started at 4.05. So we'll see you back here in five minutes. Thank you. Hi everyone, we're gonna give it about two more minutes until 4.05, then we will commence with our FPF webinar on major exploration. Hello again, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started now. My name is Caroline Forrest, and I'm one of the academic advisors with the fall program for freshmen. Um, so just wanted to give you a few quick notes before we dive into the content, just in case you're unfamiliar with the Zoom webinar feature. So the way to interact with us is to send in your questions through the Q&A box, which you can find on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window. 
So you are all muted and we cannot hear or see you. So it's totally okay if you're at home and you have background noise. Um, we can't see or hear you, it's just us here on the screen. Um, and you may see the feature for a chat box and the raise hand feature. Those are both um, disabled. So if you have a question um, to ask us, feel free to put it in the Q&A box, like I mentioned. And then myself and the two ambassadors who are here with me will answer that at the end of the presentation. And speaking of ambassadors, I'm going to invite them to come off mute and introduce themselves to share a little bit about who they are and what year they were in FPF. So Quinn, would you be able to kick it off for us? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Quinn Lichterman. Um, I was in FPF last year in fall 2021. I'm currently a sophomore at Berkeley and I'm intending to major in, I think I'm going to major in psychology with minors in public policy and in a science, technology, and society. Thanks, Quinn. Irene? Hi guys, I'm Irene. I'm a sophomore double majoring in media studies and sociology mm -hmm. and was in FPF uh, in 2020. Nice to meet you guys. Awesome. Thank you both so much. So on to our presentation about major exploration. Um, and you'll be hearing from our ambassadors throughout the presentation at the end during the Q&A too. So don't worry, you'll hear from them again soon. So um, there's a couple of timelines we wanted everyone to be aware of this summer regarding schedule planning and enrollment. So the first is that Golden Bear Advising, also known as GBA, runs from May 31st to June 21st. So this is the series of online modules that you are working on already that helps familiarize you with how to enroll in classes, um, what type of classes does FPF offer, and what are the degree requirements you can be working on as a Cal student. So this needs to be um, finished by June 21st at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. And this date is important to remember because there is an assignment in GBA called planning your fall, um, planning your FPF schedule assignment. And that essentially helps you brainstorm what type of classes you may wanna take while you're in the fall program for freshmen. So you'll be able to schedule your summer advising appointment after you complete this GBA task. And these summer advising appointments will be about 15 minutes to help you focus on what classes you'd like to take in the fall semester. Um, these will take place during the months of June and July. So next important date is uh, July 14th through July 27th. And this is the phase one of enrollment. And UC Berkeley has a couple of phases of enrollment each semester. So you'll enroll in part of your classes up to 13.5 units from July 14th to the 27th. And then starting on July 28th, you will enroll in more classes if you would like to up to 17.5 units. And so this structure is good to become familiar with over the summer because you'll be using this multi-phase enrollment model throughout the rest of your time at Berkeley. Oh, so, okay, but where do you start with major exploration? It's such a big topic to think about. What are you gonna be studying for the next four years? And Throughout this presentation, we'll be dropping different nuggets to help you along with that process. But one of the starting points that you can take with this experience is thinking about what area or topic are you interested in and what field of study that might fall under. So for example, are you fascinated by how the stars may align at night or why people make the decisions that they do? Or maybe you love spending time convincing other people to read your favorite book or examining the impact of COVID-19 in your community. Each of these activities or passions um, is associated with a particular field of study or multiple within the College of Letters and Sciences. So some of those fields of study include arts and humanities. This is majors like comparative literature, media studies, art history, English, things like, things like that. We've also got the math and physical sciences through majors like earth and planetary science, statistics, anthropology, cognitive science, et cetera. There's also biological sciences within LMS, and those are things like molecular and cellular biology and integrative biology. And then we've also got the social sciences, which are majors like economics, psychology, ethnic studies, political science, et cetera. And even some majors can transcend um, multiple uh, fields of study. So for instance, uh, linguistics is both a social science and a humanities, I'm sorry, a humanities major. So all these majors are fine and dandy, but what else is out there? So you as FPF students are a part of the College of Letters and Sciences, which is the largest college at Berkeley and has over 80 majors for you to choose from. But there are also other colleges on campus too whose majors may um, pique your interest. So some of those other colleges include the Rouser College of Natural Resources, the College of Environmental Design, 
College of Chemistry, Engineering, as well as the Haas School of Business. Um, so the majors, that, I mean, excuse me, the colleges that we highlighted in yellow um, tend to be colleges that are a little bit easier to change into. Um, and the reason we point this out is because some of these other colleges may have a major that's very fascinating to you, like conservation studies in Rouser College of Natural Resources. So if you're ever considering changing um, your major to one that's in a different college that's not LMS, you will want to go directly through the college that you're thinking about to start that process. So a college advisor and Rouser, for example, would be able to explain to you how to change into majors within that college. So we're going to start off with some myth busting because there's a lot of myths out there about um, how do you declare a major and the things you need to do to have a major in college. So everyone with me, go ahead and play along at home and keep track of all the majors, major myths that you're busting. So this first one is everyone but me already has a major. So is this true or is this a myth? And it's actually a myth. So let's bust that. So everyone is undeclared when they start in the College of Letters and Sciences. So you may have put on your application to Berkeley that you want to major in um, anthropology, but when you get here, you are actually undeclared and you can change your mind as many times as you like. So, but most students don't typically declare a major until the end of their sophomore year. And so this is a pretty standard time for people to declare a major because by the time you move into being a junior or senior, um, you're working on upper division classes that are more specific to a major. Um, but when the specific like semester or time of year when you declare your major depends on um, the specific major itself. And so each major has its own set of prere prerequisite courses, um, timelines of when and how to apply and different processes. And so you always want to check with the department that your major is in to make sure you're well aware of all of that information. So the next myth that we have is my major will determine what kind of job I get after I graduate. This is actually a myth, and so we can bust it by saying that your major and your future career are not the same thing. There isn't, there's not always a one-to-one -one correlation between what you study in school and um, what type of job you have after college. And so we encourage students to pick a major that you love to study because you'll be spending thousands of hours um, while at Berkeley studying this major, diving into the nooks and crannies of it all. So we would hope that it's something that you like to spend your time on. And so there's a lot of resources at Berkeley to help you along that process. And so we, we recommend starting with career counseling and extracurriculars to help you find out what your future career could be. Um, so career counseling resources can actually include the career center. So this is the type of place where you might go to have someone look over your resume, for example, as well as the career library. So the career library offers a whole bunch of um, career assessments that you can take to help you inventory um, and explore the different values and experiences that you wanna have in a work environment. And so these types of inventories ask you questions about what type of activities you like to do, what do you value, what settings do you like to do these things in? And based upon those responses, they can help you pinpoint um, different majors and fields of study you may want to pursue. So these aren't trying to push you into a certain major or put you in a box of what you can and can't do, but they're more an exploratory tool to help you um, identify and explore what um, types of skills you have, what you would like to work on, and what environments those would be good in. Additionally, extracurricular activities like internships or participation in leadership and student organizations, clubs, Greek life, uh, volunteering and part-time jobs are also really great opportunities to help you prepare for and find a career that matches your skills and interests. Next, the next myth that we have is that if I change majors, I won't be able to graduate on time. So this is a very understandable and relatable myth, but it is actually indeed a myth. So many students will actually change their majors multiple times and still graduate within four years. It's totally normal to start off as one major and then end up as another one. So if you find yourself ever in this camp, um, please do talk to um, an advisor such as your FPF advisor or this is at a later point in your college experience, your LNS college advisor, um, so that way you can understand all the different paths forward. Uh, myth number four, I don't have time to take classes just for fun. What do we think? Busted. So most majors are actually about 50 units 
and you need a minimum of 120 units to graduate, which means that there's built in room to help you take classes that are just for fun and can introduce you to new topics. So this 120 uh, minimum number of units to graduate includes uh, major courses, degree requirements, electives, and units from previous college coursework or test credit. Um, so these elective units, that, that class that you think sounds super interesting, but not sure if it could count towards a major, that could be really useful helping you get closer to graduation or discovering or developing new interests that you may not have known that you had and building out a social network as well. And our last myth is research equals white lab coats. Is that true? Well, not necessarily. There is actually um, a lot of different kinds of research that you can be doing at Berkeley, um, such as the undergraduate research apprenticeship program for more, in, which has information about um, how to do, how to craft your research project within various disciplines, such as arts, business, technology, race, gender, et cetera. Um, so that's one of the programs that you can engage in and one of my ambassadors will put the link for that program into the chat for me and the second program that you can participate in is called the summer undergraduate research fellowship program or surf and so this is another program similar to the first one i mentioned but this takes place during the summer additionally many academic departments also have research specific courses that you can take as a part of your major um, and they also have research activities and assignments integrated into the um, other classes that you can take too um, out of curiosity quinn or irene have either of you all like related to any of these myths before as you were thinking about what majors you wanted to study um i definitely have i did not know in my first semester that People, everyone was undeclared. I, whenever I talked to friends and they said, oh, I'm gonna major in this, I assumed that 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 is what they're majoring for sure. But um, later I learned that everyone is really technically undecided. And um, even the second one as well, um, I did think that if I majored in like psychology, for example, I would have to end up like being a psychologist or research psychology. But in fact, um, you can major in something and then study something that's not even that related because the majors you learn a lot of general skills that will apply to any job you end up doing yeah absolutely i think that's the beauty of like a degree from a liberal arts institution or a school that has letters and sciences in it because it teaches you a lot of skills that they call transferable skills that you can use in a lot of different settings thanks quinn irene was anything did anything stand out to you with these yeah. myths? So at the beginning of my first semester i want to major in economics and media studies but like after the first semester, I thought that economics uh, has so many like mathematics, so many heavy mathematics. And I tried something new about sociology class, about the introduction of sociology. So I think that is so interesting and even like push me or encourage me to major in that major. So yes. I definitely changed the major plan from economics to sociology, but I think that definitely not delay or pushback about my like, whole progress of the college. Oh, that's awesome, Irene. Thank you. Can I ask you a follow-up question to that? So when you took the sociology class, did you take it as like an elective or as a breadth course and that's how you came upon it? Oh, so uh, the introduction to sociology could, uh, could be counted as both the one of the breadth courses about the social sciences, also the pre prerequisite for both media studies and sociology majors. Gotcha. That's a cool example. And we're going to get into what this breadth and prerequisite thing means in a little bit later, but that's good to know that you took a class for fun and for a requirement and it ended up working out for you. Thank you both for sharing that. Cool. So, okay, all these myths are great, but how do you build a schedule while exploring majors? So that's going to be the focus for the next part of our presentation here. Um, so before we can tell you like what classes you can take in FPF, we do want to help you understand a little bit about the requirements that you'll have to take as a letters and sciences student. So here's an overview of the subject and unit requirements needed for graduation. So unit requirements and information included on the right hand side of the screen are specific to the College of Letters and Sciences it's right here. And this may seem like a lot to accomplish in four years and it is a lot to accomplish, but you will find that there are many ways for you to make the most of these requirements. And this is why we have advisors at Berkeley to help you wade through the waters of all of these requirements on the screen. So 
First up, we have university requirements. And these are something that every student at every UC school has to complete. So even students at UC Davis have to do the entry level writing requirement to some degree. So the other university requirements we have are American history and American institutions. So next we have the Berkeley campus requirement. And so the only Berkeley campus requirement that we have is a class or as a series of classes called the American cultures. So um, the American cultures classes examine the sociocultural complexity of the United States and they're indicated by um, the suffix AC. So the last two letters of the class will say AC and it's that way, you know, it's an American cultures. And they come from various disciplines. So for example, one of the FPF classes that fulfills American cultures is Geography 50 AC. So it counts towards American cultures and it also fulfills the social and behavioral science breadth over here too. So FPF also has American culture classes in linguistics, sociology, history, gender, women's studies, et cetera. Um, and I do also want to touch on one thing here. You all heard me mention the 120 unit minimum. So this is a unit requirement that all students have to take. And so this 120 includes a lot of these other requirements that you see on the screen, but it also does take into consideration upper division classes. And so upper divisions are classes that are numbered from one to 199, um, and they tend to be very major specific. First year students tend to focus a little bit more on lower division classes. So those are classes numbered one through 99. Something to think about, but you'll be taking more upper divisions later on in your career. The next section is about requirements for the College of Letters and Sciences. So all LNS students must complete um, these essential skills and the seven course breadth. So the essential skills includes reading composition parts A and B. So you have to complete this entry level writing before you can move into reading and composition. But aside from that, you also have to work on quantitative reasoning and foreign language too. So all these must be completed with a C minus grade or better and they have to be done Reading composition has to be done by the end of your sophomore year, but quantitative re reasoning in foreign language can um, need to be completed by the time you graduate. So the next part of the LNS college requirements is the seven course breadth. So we mentioned this a little bit before when Irene and I were talking about that sociology class that she took, but seven course breadth is a collection of seven classes that you take to expose you to a wide range of disciplines. So I want you to think about a college degree kind of like this. So college degrees are about breadth and depth of study. So your major that you will eventually decide gives you depth in a specific area or two if you double major, whereas these breadths and other college requirements give you a taste of many different subjects. So with the seven course breadth, you have to take um, one class for each category. So one arts and literature, one international studies, et cetera. Um, they need to be either a C minus letter grade or pass no pass. And pass no pass grading is essentially where um, you do not receive a letter grade or any GPA points. It's just whether did you pass the class or not? Yes or no. So that's okay too for these breadth courses. Um, and high school exam scores are actually not accepted for seven courses, seven course breaths. You do have to take them at Berkeley or um, transferable from California community colleges. And these also must be completed prior to graduation. The cool thing about breaths is that we can use them to explore majors and some of the major prerequisites you may already be thinking about taking, they may also count as a seven course breath. So, the classes that you know you need to take, such as the ones I just showed you on the screen, can serve as a foundation for your schedule, especially if you're not sure what direction you want to take. Um, and additionally, some of these requirements are also major prerequisites. So, for example, if you're thinking about applying to the House School of Business to study business administration, they require reading and composition um, to be done before you start at Haas. That's also co conveniently an LNS college requirement, too. So there's a little bit of overlap that you can use to your advantage as you um, think about what you want to spend your time studying here at Berkeley. So here we have an outline of a balanced course load for first year students as it incorporates one to two classes to explore majors. So we have a couple classes here that you could use to take for a major you're already thinking about or take a class where it's a major you've never heard about. That way you can utilize that space to explore. And additionally, we would encourage you to think about taking a reading composition if you still need it and quantitative reasoning if you still need it too, because these two classes are very foundational for classes you may take in your major that require a certain um, math and writing competency. 
And additionally, we would think it's a good idea to balance it out with a breadth and or elective course. And so this structure is just an overall outline. You can adjust depending upon your circumstances and interests and whether you had incoming credit to help you out with certain requirements and what you feel like you need to take per your interests. So when you're creating a balanced schedule, you may come across, the, you may think to yourself, well, how do I know if a class would be for a major or a breadth requirement? This is a great question. And the answer to that is you don't technically need to know right now. Um, so let me give you an example to help clarify this. So let's say you take philosophy too because you're really interested in the philosophy major. But it turns out as you're taking the class, you don't like philosophy and don't want to pursue that as a major. That's totally okay. Philosophy too still counts towards the philosophy and breadth values or the philosophy and values breadth requirement. Um, even if you still don't plan on using it as a major, you can count it towards that philosophy breadth. So it's okay to pick classes that sound interesting to you. And later on, as you get more into the class, you'll be able to better understand whether that's something you want to apply towards a major or a topic that you just want to count as a, a degree requirement. So uh, before we get into these sample schedules, I was hoping if one of our ambassadors could share about what classes they took in their freshman year. If you all remember, and it was a little while ago. <laughs> in my first semester at FPF, I took four breadth courses and one of them uh, fulfilled the, uh, one of the prerequisites of media studies, uh, which is uh, his X history 7B about the U.S. history after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So other, uh, other three brass courses um, related to physics, um, bi uh, not biology, uh, social sciences, mm -hmm. and philosophy, and yeah, philosophy. So that's my first semester. And for my freshman year spring semester, I took more about the prerequisites of my majors, which includes stats, uh, sociology one and sociology five and R&B course. Um, so like, I think in my freshman year, I basically fulfill most of the breadth requirements and like the R&B requirement. So that, yeah, that's my first year plan. Yeah, thank you for sharing. That's a good balance of like uh, college requirements, but also working towards a major once you found out a little bit more direction of what you wanted to do. Thank you. Quinn, what did you take this past year as a first year student? Yeah, um, in my first semester, I took um, Anthropology 1A to fulfill a breadth requirement. I took um, Environmental Science uh, ESPM 50AC, which fulfills American cultures and it fulfills a breadth course. Um, and then I took Ancient Greek and Roman Studies 44, which um, fulfills a writing B requirement and also a breath course. Um, I thought it was really helpful to take classes that fulfilled both a breath course and also a different requirement. Um, it really helps get them out of the way. And then in my second semester, I finished my breaths with Psychology 101, called Econ 101, um, which are both upper divisions. And then I took um, Philosophy 12A, which is a logic class and um, I was my third class. Uh, oh, uh, Science, Sense, and Sensibility 22, which is a general uh, letter in science class. Very fascinating array of classes for me both. Thank you so much for sharing those examples. So now that we've got a, a little sense of like what Quinn and Irene took in their first year, let's see a couple more um, potential sample schedules that you can take depending upon what discipline you might be interested in. So with some of these sample schedules, we just want to show you the overall structure that you could be taking on with your schedule planning. So you don't have to follow these to a T. Make sure to pick classes that are most appropriate to you and your interests. So for someone who's thinking, um, remember those are majors like English, art history, et cetera. They might take a class like philosophy too for a major exploration. Then they also follow that with anthropology one, which would satisfy biological sciences breadth. And then they would also work on a college requirement, such as comparative literature R1A, which fulfills the reading composition Part A requirement. And then at the end, they may round things out with an elective class, such as LNS1, exploring the liberal arts. So this class is really, um, really useful for incoming first year students, and I will touch on it more later, but it's essentially a two unit elective class where each week you overview a different cluster of majors within the College of Letters and Sciences. So you could take an actual class for units to help you explore majors on campus. So this could be a really useful tool for people who want to do more wide ranging exploration of majors. 
And so all these four classes round out to be about 14 units or total, which is a nice balanced number um, for your first semester. So let's see a sample schedule for someone and who is thinking about physical sciences major. So they may start off with Math 1A, which is a major requirement for pretty much every um, physical sciences major. So there are multiple different types of math and the math that you would wanna take for a particular major will depend upon that major requirements. But for physical sciences, we'll start off with Math 1A. Um, a class that this person could take for major exploration might be Environmental Science Policy and Management 15, also known as ESPM. Um, so this class is for major exploration. After that, you could take a class like English R1B to fulfill the reading composition Part B requirement and then finish things off with a breadth course such as Film 50. And this would give you about 15 minutes overall. Next, for someone who is thinking about a biological sciences major like MCB or IB, you would start off with Math 10A, which is a calculus class similar to the Math 1A that I mentioned earlier, but Math 10A is a combination of calc, statistics, and combinatorics, and it tends to be preferred by um, the bio biology science types of majors. Um, additionally, someone in this camp might want to take Psychology 1 because this is a pre-health requirement, so a lot of the pre-health professional schools like med schools require some type of social sciences class. So psychology one is a great choice there. Um, additionally, someone in this camp would also want to take English R1A because it works towards the reading composition college requirement. And it's also a pre-health requirement too because med schools require some, at least a year of intensive reading and writing um, coursework. Additionally, um, this person may want to take a decal class. So this is another two unit elective class. Um, it's different from the other one I mentioned because decal courses are actually student run and they range on a variety of topics each semester. So this is the place where you can choose something you've never tried before like salsa dancing or meditation or vegan cooking or the native Hawaiian language um, just to give you a chance to learn something new. So Quinn or Irene, have either of you taken a decal class during your time here at Berkeley? Um, in my first semester, I applied to a few decal courses, but there are like a lot of the decal courses are pretty competitive to get into um, because they're very popular and they're really interesting because there may be some more fun topics than you might normally get in a normal class. Um, <laughs> but they do have that if you apply and you don't get into your first semester, um, they'll give you possibly priority in the following semester or following year to get into that decal. Gosh, and that's really cool to know. Yeah, there are a lot of really cool topics. I can understand they're very popular choices. Did you happen to take any uh, decals, Irene? Uh, in my first semester, I took a decal about cooking, but I think that course is kind of weird because uh, that course requires me to write a paper, final paper for the for a decal course. So, like, I think after that, I did not take decal anymore, but I think there are still so many excellent opportunities of decal there, like such as K-pop topic or mm -hmm. so many interesting topics, yeah. Yeah, I think there was one this past semester on just on BTS, so I'm sure that was a really exciting class to take at this time of year. Cool, thank you all for sharing that. Um, so we've got one more sample schedule here, and this might be for someone who's thinking about social sciences majors, um, such as psychology or poli-sci or global studies, for example. So this individual could take global studies 10B, um, which is a three unit class they could count towards the global studies major. Um, but if they're also thinking about political science, you can take poli-sci 2 and FPF, and that could count towards a um, potential major if they want to pursue political science. Additionally, statistics too would be a good class to use to fulfill quantitative um, reasoning requirement. And then the South and Southeast Asia studies R5A is a class that could count towards the um, reading composition part A requirement. And this would give you an overall um, unit count of about 15 units. Next, another sample schedule um, is for people who are still exploring their major requirements, just like everyone in this room, but something that pairs it down even a little bit more. Um, you could start off with the college rating R1A. This is a class that's six units, so you've noticed it's a little bit higher than some of the other classes we mentioned. And this is because this class is called Accelerated Reading and Composition, and it helps you fulfill both the entry level writing requirement and reading and composition part A. So it is a heavy duty class, but it's really useful because it can help you fulfill um, two requirements, especially if you have not fulfilled entry-level writing through AP exam or other methods yet. 
um, so in addition to reading a, compass, a college writing or one a this person may also want to take environmental science policy and management at 15, which could count for a biological or physical sciences breadth, um, and anthropology one, which could count towards social and behavioral sciences or the biological sciences breadth. So this is actually a good place for me to point out too that you may notice that some of these classes count for two breaths, but because it's the seven course breadth, you need one class for each category. So in this case, you would pick whether you want the class to go for bio sci or physical sci or social and behavioral sciences or biological sciences. So I believe that concludes the sample schedules that we have for the moment, but I want you to notice that there's, we try to aim for balance with these schedules on your first semester. So balance in the sense of you don't have all math and science classes or all reading and writing heavy classes. I mean, that can be hard to tell when you're just picking classes for the first time and haven't taken the classes yet, but you want to think about what type of information might I learn in this class and reading the course description will give you a sense of that so that way you're not overloaded with one type of activity. Um, similarly, the same thing with papers and projects versus exams too. You don't want to be taking um, a class that has all, all writing assignments that you have to do. You want a little bit of balance to keep your brain excited and engaged. Um, and also this maybe seem common sense, but hopefully you're excited about at least one class that you signed up for. So I encourage you to read the course descriptions on the FPF website and in the Berkeley guide. So that way um, you have something to look forward to in those classes, you'll feel like are worth your time. You'll be spending 16 weeks studying whatever the topic is about. So time to get excited about it or develop a new interest or something. And last but not least, you'll want to keep the overall unit count in mind. And so you may have noticed with some of the um, sample schedules that I showed that we have overall unit counts that range from like 14 to 13 units, for example. So this is important because um, you do not want to overload yourself with too many units in your first semester. And so in FPF, the minimum number of units you can enroll in is 13 and the maximum number is 17.5. And we keep that range because historically students who stay within that 13 to 17.5 range tend to have better GPAs because it's a more manageable um, course load that helps you not only get used to the way Berkeley professors teach, but also all the other things that are going on in your first semester, such as making new friends and getting involved. That's a lot to handle. And so um, one thing that we can control is how many units you choose to enroll in. So definitely something to bring up to your assigned FPF advisor during your summer advising appointment too. A couple more schedule planning tips that we have accumulated pertains to um, with the units pertaining to like prioritizing the classes. So because we have that two phase enrollment model that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you'll want to prioritize the classes you enroll in by phase. And so just as a reminder, phase one, you enroll in a maximum 13.5 units. And then if you would like to go higher than that during phase two, you can go at up to 17.5 units. So in phase one, you'll want to prioritize class, any classes that could, you're using as major prerequisite courses and anything that counts as reading and composition, especially if you are planning on taking that six unit college writing R1A class. After you get those, then you can fit in breath requirements, American cultures, other classes of that nature, and then last but not least, elective classes and enrichment courses. Cool. So something that you can be doing throughout this time of choosing what classes you're interested in and planning for your fall semester is playing the guide game. And so the guide game is a major exploration tool that a lot of advisors on campus recommend because it helps you become familiar with all the 80 plus majors and minors and programs that Berkeley has to offer. Because it would be hard to do major exploration if you don't have a sense of what majors are out there, right? So um, on this website, which is called the Berkeley Academic Guide, and you can access it on guide.berkeley.edu, so this website is going to be one of your best friends while you're in college. It has the class schedule where you, where you can look up classes, but it also has tabs in the undergraduate field where you can see all the majors that LNS has to offer. So I'll make sure to include the instructions here. So essentially how you approach the guide game is going to that website, guide.berkeley.edu. And once you get to the major section, you can filter just to see all the letters and sciences majors that are there. And so we encourage you to sift through these majors and there's a lot there. So it's a lot of uh, reading that you'll have to do, but it's important to give you a sense of what's out there. You can even narrow it down a little bit to area of interest, such as physical sciences majors or um, what, even, what career opportunities are associated with particular majors too. 
And so as you narrow it down, check out the different majors, see what classes you have to take. What are the professors like? Can you talk to, to an advisor in that program? As you're reading through, those are all things you'll wanna be thinking about. And then if you're interested in learning more, by all means, go visit the um, department's main office when you're on campus in the fall or visit their website. That way you can connect with current students in the major, uh, major advisors, faculty, scholarship opportunities, and research topics. Those are all things that you'll be spending a lot of time in once you declare a major. So it's definitely something you want to check out in advance. So as you're going through this website of looking through all the different majors and playing the guide game, um, we do encourage you to sit down with a piece of paper or a Word document and write down the majors that stand out to you. So reading through all the different names, and if you're not sure what something is about, go ahead and click on that tile to see what um, cognitive science is all about. Let's see what courses are required. What are the upper division classes you'll be taking as a student there? Um, and as you're reading all these different requirements and opportunities associated with the major, notice what type of reactions you have when you're reading that information. Does something excite you and you want to write it down and take that class immediately? Or is there a lot of classes in there that sound kind of boring? Those are really important distinctions to pay attention to because we'll be spending a lot of time studying that particular major. So as you're going through this process, if a class sounds appealing, write it down so you can remember it later. If it sounds disinteresting, scratch it off the list. And so once you have a sense of like what the classes are like there, you can get a better idea of if that's a major you want to pursue. So if all the classes in there sound super fascinating, you'd love to take them, cool. Bookmark that major to come back to and review at another time because that may give you a sign that that may be something you'd want to pursue. And so this is not only a process of exploration, but it's also a process of elimination too. So keep eliminating majors on the list and bookmarking the interesting ones until you narrow it down to about five or seven. And then once you've narrowed it down, you take that opportunity to go talk to major advisors in that office or current students in the program too. That way you can get a sense of the community and more information about um, more information about that major. So this may sound like an arduous process, but it's something you can be working on for your first few semesters at Cal. And of course you have your F-Grip advisor to help you along the way in exploring the different major options out there too. So some of the other ways that you can identify majors and what you might be interested in include um, sitting in on classes. And so this may be new to some people, but you can actually sit in on classes at Berkeley if you're curious to know what the topic is about. Just ask the professor when you get to the room or send them an email. So that way um, you have their permission to join the class, but you can show up and see what that lecture is about to help you give a little taste of if you would like to study something within that major. Something else you can do is talk to instructors too. We'll be spending a lot of time with the instructors and professors for your particular major. So it's, it's a good chance to get to know them, see what they like to research, what type of relationships they have with students. Um, this is important because instructors can really shape the trajectory and the content that you'll be studying. Similarly, you can talk to current students. Um, we've got our FPF ambassadors here to share their perspective and they'll be around throughout your fall semester too. So always available to talk to you about their major experience. But also each major tends to have a lot of like student run organizations or even peer advisors that love talking to interested students about their experience in the major. So don't hesitate to reach out. I know Berkeley students will love to share what their um, perspective is like. Of course, you can also talk to an advisor that's really helpful for you to understand how do you graduate with that particular major and what are the requirements that you need for it. So in addition to talking to people, you can also attend events that that major or that program offers. This is a great way to see what type of community is present within the program and how they apply concepts from the major and the classes into real life activities. And like we mentioned earlier, research is very much ingrained into the fabric and culture of Berkeley. So see what type of research opportunities are available with that particular major. Is there a professor who's researching um, COVID-19 in a way that you find to be really fascinating? See if you can make a connection there. That might be a type of relationship that can help you explore um, a potential major in that field. And of course, last but not least, there's the LMS1 class that I mentioned earlier. And so this is a class that's offered in both the summer and in the fall semesters. Um, so you can take it summer or you can take it in the fall and it helps you explore different areas of study within the College of Letters and Sciences. And so I believe I mentioned earlier, but I think each week they focus on a different cluster of majors so you get the chance to learn about all the different options that we have in LNS. And their website is here on the screen too.
Okay, so we've covered a lot of content about major exploration and schedule planning. So um, at this time, we can go ahead and answer some of the questions in the Q&A. So um, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen and pull up the Q&A feature to get to those. Let's see. So we have one question. Um, am I allowed to take performing arts classes that are offered by the Theater Dance Performance Studies Department and FPF for fall 2022? So that is a great question to the person who asked it. Um, you can take um, two classes of two units or less, and some of them are offered through the Theater Dance and Performance Studies Department. And the full list of those classes is available on our website. And I will make sure to put that link in the chat for us. And of course, if you're ever um, if you're ever curious to know more about what types of main campus classes you can take as an FPS student, please don't hesitate to reach out to your um, assigned FPF advisor to learn more. So we just got a question: and where exactly do we sign up for classes? Um, and one of my ambassadors, would y'all like to explain where does one sign up for classes? So that's a really good technical question. So to sign up for, uh, for classes, you could like before the day you, you like add your course, you can like add in the shopping, shopping cart at mm -hmm. Call Central. And by the time, like exact time you want to enroll for the classes, definitely like do that for, mm -hmm. uh, to enroll from the shopping cart. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so basically the location, the location is at Call Central website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, good point. You mentioned two really good things. One, so Cal Central is the place where you will enroll in your classes. And so use Cal Central to um, see what tasks you have to do as a new student, financial aid, academics, grades, all that stuff. And within there is a, a spot called the Enrollment Center. So that's the actual place where you'll be adding the classes. And so Irene mentioned a really helpful resource called the Shopping Cart. And this is all outlined in your Golden Bear Advising, but essentially the Shopping Cart is a tool where you can save all the classes you're interested in. And then from that Shopping Cart, you can hit the Enroll button and you're enrolled in the class. So it's just like kind of like online shopping essentially. So it's a really helpful tool. Okay, next question. So is it possible to take the LMS1 class online during the summer? Um, yes, it is possible to take it um, during the summer and during the fall semester. I don't know the modality of how it's being offered this summer, but I would certainly look that up um, on the summer sessions website to get a better sense of if it's online or in person. But the answer is yes, you can take that class. Yeah, I actually took LMS1 online last summer. Oh yeah, um, what so, was it like? Um, it was it was good. It was um, I didn't really know much about Berkeley. I didn't do much research about the college, and so it helped me learn more about different professors and programs. Um, so I'm I'm sure they're offering it online. Yeah, good point. And do I believe that class is pretty much only asynchronous. So I think it would have to be offered online. So thanks for adding that perspective. Right. Yeah. 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 I took mine asynchronous. Awesome. So following up to that, someone wants to know, does LMS 1 fulfill any breadth or college requirements? So LMS 1 um, does not fulfill any requirements. It's one of those like um, elective enrichment classes you can take as an FPS student. So it's one of those things that's useful because it exposes you to different topics. So it does not satisfy a requirement, but it's still useful in that sense. Um, following up to the question about how do decal classes work, such as in terms of teaching, grading, or credit. So decal classes are sponsored by an academic department and a particular faculty member within that department, but they are taught by an undergraduate student facilitator. And so they are graded in the sense of like, you'll have assignments and attendance most likely for these types of classes, but they are on a pass, no pass basis, meaning that you don't earn GPA points for it. But if you pass the course um, by the standards set by the instructor, then you'll earn the units for that two unit decal class. And if you don't pass the class, you do not earn units for it. Irene, yeah, did you have something else you wanted to say about uh, decals? No, I, I think you pretty like cover all those things about the car. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah, I thought you were about to type that answer, so thank you. Um, one question about is the foreign language class a semester long class? So foreign language classes are, tip, the requirement itself asks you to demonstrate proficiency in um, two semesters worth of foreign language. So some students um, are able to take a placement test 
for a particular language to determine what level that you could be in for that language series. So you could take two semesters of a foreign language to satisfy that. Or let's say you have experience um, as a heritage speaker of Spanish, you may be able to test out of the first semester of Spanish and then take the second semester equivalent. But it's at minimum the proficiency showing at least two semesters worth of work. Um, one question came in from a, an attendee is, is signing up for classes on a first come first serve basis, will I be at a disadvantage if I'm unable to sign up straight away? Um, so this is a great question. I'll give an answer that I'll uh, throw it over to one of my ambassadors to chime in. So the way that enrollment works, like Irene was describing, you use the shopping cart in Cal Central. And so there's a typically a start date for each of the phases, right? But every student at Berkeley has an assigned um, enrollment time within that phase. So July 14th is the first day when first year students can start enrolling, but each first year student has a particular time throughout that day that they can start enrolling in. So some people have 9 a.m., some people have 3 p.m., it's a randomized time. So after, once that time starts, then you can start enrolling in classes. Ambassadors, do you all have any thoughts about like when your time comes around, do you typically log in right away or do you give it a little bit? What's your approach there? Sorry, can you repeat that last part of it? I was, I was answering a Q&A question. Yeah, no, you're all good. So I was curious on this um, question about like, what time do you sign up for classes as and on a first come first serve basis? What's your approach? Do you start at your assigned time or do you wait a little okay. bit? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think whenever your time is, it's probably best to kind of as soon as you can. I, I know they spread out the times across a couple of days usually and mm -hmm. it is probably better to have a, a sooner time. Um, and so whenever my time is like, I go and log in. Um, you might, I mean, I have had having a later time in like a class, one class I want is uh, full, but so I take a different class instead. Um, it's always good to have a backup, but you can always take that class the next semester or find a replacement. There's usually um, multiple classes that can fill any requirement. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's a good point. So this, this goes back to the thing that Irene was mentioning with that shopping cart feature where you can save the classes you want ahead of time. You can also do that for backup classes. So, so if you do happen to have a later time and something that you want fills up, you can fill in another class for the time being. Let's see what other questions that we have. Um, let's see here. So we did have questions about um, double majoring, double minoring, major and minor undergrad grad program. So I'll try to tackle them in a, in a group essentially. So there may be a couple of uh, four year plus one programs on campus where you could start off at a bachelor's and take additional coursework to earn a master's. Um, to learn more, I would go towards that guide.berkeley.edu website we talked about earlier. That will showcase not only all of the bachelors that Berkeley has to offer, but also the master programs. Um, additionally, is it difficult or unrecommended to double major or minor? or unrelated, for example, with two different topics. So double majoring and double minoring um, or major and minoring is a very common thing for Berkeley students to do. I've even seen some students who uh, have triple majors. Um, it's definitely possible, but you'll want to consult with your FPF advisor um, about how to start off on that process. That way you can choose prerequisite courses in your first semester that align with your goals in that regard. Um, Irina, I feel like you have a major and a minor, right? Or do you also double major? Do you have any thoughts about that experience? So uh, I'm double major media studies and sociology. So you mean the experience of double major? Yes, yeah, tell us about that. Okay, so I think media studies and sociology are pretty uh, overlapping mm -hmm. uh, to some degree, uh, but like for upper division, you are only allowed to overlap two courses, two upper mm -hmm. division courses, but for prerequisites, you could like, overlap as many as you want, but there's not that many overlapping courses. Yeah, but I think um, at least sociology one and sociology five could, could be counted as media studies um, mm -hmm. prerequisites. And sociology five is one of the research methods elective for media studies. So mm -hmm. I think like double majoring um, would definitely like broaden the horizon of all like uh, one major, but definitely like balance your schedule not like um not be like uh, I want a double major just because I have two majors it's so fancy I'll, I'll do that yeah 
Yeah, you bring up a really good point about like, it's really a balancing act of like, what classes can count for what? When should I take them? What's the right balance? So I don't take too many units in the semester. And I really like what you said, Irene, about don't double major just to double major. I've seen that happen before. And you are taking a little bit of extra units each semester to make that work. So I encourage you all, if you're thinking about double majoring or even getting a major from two different colleges, think about your reasoning behind that and hold on to that because that will sustain you through um, the balancing act of two different majors. Yeah, I'm also planning to, my, I'm doing one major and I'm planning on doing two or three minors. And for minors, you cannot overlap. There's no prereqs. It's just like a set of classes, like five or six classes about for the minor. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think I'm going to do three. And I think it's very doable even to do three minors. Um, you have a lot of time over four years to take a lot of classes. Yes, we, lo we love stacking on different majors and minors. I'm proud of both of you all for exploring different topics. So one quick note, if you're not familiar with the concept of a minor, a minor is essentially um, usually five to six classes or so that gives you a taste about a particular topic. And so not every major program has a minor and not every minor has an associated major too. Let's see, here are some other good questions to take out. Um, someone asked, how do you know which classes will not be full throughout phase two? Um, and so the, this can be a concern if you're worried about classes filling up, because sometimes that does happen at Berkeley. There's a lot of students buying for classes, but with FPF classes, because we have you do this two-phase enrollment system, everyone participates in that 13.5 unit cap at first. So that way, all the good classes aren't gobbled up in the very beginning of enrollment. So everyone's spread out on the number of classes they can sign up for at the beginning. That way, there may be extra spots available for you. And so as you're planning your schedule during this two-phase enrollment process, it is a good idea to check in on the classes you're thinking about taking and to see if there's um, how many seats are still available. And if you're feeling like there may be the class you want might be full already or you're not sure if you'll be able to get it, it's always good to have a backup a class already just in case. But this is why we have some advising appointments at FPF so you can work with your assigned advisor on what strategies would be most useful to you. Um, someone asked a really good question. So just for clarification, am I going to be able to declare my major once I have fulfilled all the necessary prerequisites? So essentially, yes. So there's a lot of, or there's not always a lot of, but there's usually a handful of prerequisite courses that each major requires before you can apply to declare that. And so sometimes there may also be an application component with those prerequisite courses. So you might have to write a personal statement or some type of essay about why you want to apply or declare within that major. And then there may also be a certain deadline um, when you need to submit all these materials in order to declare for this major. And so for whatever majors you're considering, we highly encourage you to look on that major department's website to understand those different criteria. So that way you can do a little bit of reverse planning to make sure you've got all your ducks in a row. And of course, feel free to reach out to your FPF advisor for help in finding that information, because I know it can be a little hard to locate sometimes. Um, this is another good question that we probably should have clarified in the beginning. So what are considered FPF classes? Do we only take these classes during the first semester? So um, FPF students, so you'll be taking at least three core classes in the fall program for freshmen. So we have a curriculum of courses that count towards major requirements and LNS as well as breadth and reading and composition, et cetera. So all the classes that you saw me showing in the sample schedules, those are all examples of real FPF classes that we're offering this fall or in the past semester. So you do take only you do take the three main FPF classes, but you can also take select main campus unit classes such as two unit or less electives or a handful of three plus unit courses. Um, someone else asked, how are the American history and American institutions requirements fulfilled? Um, a lot of students fulfill those requirements through high school coursework, especially if you're coming from the United States. Um, if you're an international student, I do believe there is a waiver depending upon your visa status to waive these requirements, but there's also classes at Berkeley that you can take to help satisfy these, such as Political Science 1 or History 7B. Um, so there are various options that you can use to fulfill those, and if you're curious to learn more about that, your Golden Bear advice have a list of how to satisfy American history and institutions. 
So since we, we do have a couple more questions that maybe we weren't able to answer during this webinar, so I encourage you all to reach out to your assigned FPF advisor, either myself, Sarah Gamboa, or Brandon Vasa, to share these questions with them if you have any um, questions that we were not able to answer today. So before we wrap up, Quinn or Irene, is there, do you all have any lingering thoughts or recommendations for a major exploration? Um, yeah, I mean, I would just say overall, um, my advice would be to fulfill your breaths first. Um, like with my last, I did not have no idea what I wanted to study uh, when I came into Berkeley. And so I just took a bunch of different breath requirements um, that I knew could also fulfill some major prerequisites that I was maybe interested in. Mm -hmm. And then later on in my second semester and after my second semester, I decided that I might want to do psychology. And because I already fulfilled all these breath requirements and through some of those fulfilled a lot of the psychology breaths, uh, sorry, the psychology prereqs, um, it was very easy for me to just now focus on psychology and um, get started with the major and minor that I want to do. That's absolutely a direction that you could take as working toward press and then give you more information about what you wanted, what, what you wanted to pursue later on. Thanks for sharing that, Quinn. Irene, any last thoughts? Yeah, so my suggestion would be like, don't be afraid to try something new and it's never late to like have a new thought or plan because for example one of my gs uh, of sociology like um he like changed her major plan at sophomore year mm -hmm. um, from biology to sociology and now he mm -hmm. is a sociology phd which is so good so it's never late to have a new idea absolutely thank you both so much for your perspectives and sharing this and thank you also to the audience members for coming today to learn about major exploration so we will record this uh, this webinar has been recorded and it will be available on the fpf youtube page for you to watch at a later time and thank you so much and everyone have a great rest of your evening and enjoy your summer goodbye